The Tom Woods Show, episode 2299. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Come on now, folks. If you ain't going to start that side hustle now, then when? Check out my free ebook, Five Paths to an Online Income, where I take you step by step through five things that I do that keep food on the Woods household table and how you can do them too. Check it out at pathstoincome.com. Hey, folks, Tom Woods here. I have never had Peter St. Ange on the show before, but we are rectifying that terrible injustice today. He is an economist at the Heritage Foundation, a great guy. I've been reading his articles for quite some time. And I want to talk to him about this whole Silicon Valley Bank thing. I mean, yes, I'm a few days late on this, but maybe better to let the dust settle a little bit before jumping right in. That's my excuse, Peter, for being late on this. I was waiting for the dust to settle, you see. But anyway, glad to have you. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me on, Tom. And that's the big question. Is the dust going to settle? They keep stirring it back up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to talk about what happened. We're going to talk about the policy response. Because, of course, as you know, we've heard some people saying the response to what happened is not going to cause the kind of moral hazard problem that we've had in the past because we're wiping out the stockholders and all this whole thing. We want to go into that. There's actually a pretty good article on National Review Online I want to refer to that Peter Klein sent me, our mutual friend. A couple of his friends wrote a pretty good piece on this. But let's start off for normal people. What do normal people need to know about this bank they've never heard of? Right. So Silicon Valley Bank was kind of a country club bank for a Silicon Valley elite. So if you were a relatively small startup, even if you had funding, you would go to them and they would tell you, ah, come back when you're bigger. And so that meant that roughly 97% of the money in this bank was not insured by the FDIC, right? The FDIC only goes up to 250000 It's only for the middle class and the poor. And so meanwhile, this bank here was roughly the 16th largest in the country. So there's a pretty large bank. They had some shenanigans, it seems, going on with their lending that caused a lot of problems for them. But really what pushed them over the edge is something that is true for just about every bank in America, which is that the Federal Reserve whipsawing interest rates absolutely savage their assets. So it turns out they didn't have nearly as much in the vault as they should have. And that's really what pushed them over the edge. All right. So now what we were told after we heard about this, the trouble they were in, was that if some kind of package was not put together, there would be terrible effects on innocent bystanders. It could spread. You could have a massive bank run. And of course, we can't know what these contrary to fact scenarios would have been. But on the other hand, I can understand why people connected to this bank in one way or another would want to spread this kind of idea. Because of course, then that puts pressure on everybody. You better put a package together. You certainly don't want a systemic crisis. You don't want the whole banking system to collapse, do you? So that was the propaganda we got. So over the weekend, then Sunday night, a package was put together that is supposed to satisfy people like you and me who oppose bailouts by saying, look, this is not a bailout like we had in 2008. What we have in this case, the people like the stockholders, for instance, these people are not going to get bailed out. They're not going to be made whole. The only people we're going to help are the depositors, who generally are institutional depositors, who had deposits above the $250,000 FDIC limit. And of course, a company is going to be, you know, mom and pop don't have $250,000 in the bank, but right. a company is very likely to have more than that. So we're just going to be helping those people. We're going to cover the excess over the $250,000 for all of them. And that's the American way. You know, depositors are made whole in the old U.S. of A. So you have any problem with that, Peter St. Ange? Yeah, well, it's the same pattern in every crisis, which is the first thing they do is look for the human shields that they can use to squeeze out a bailout. And always it's the same with the dominoes. Okay, so, you know, if this goes, then the next bank is going to go. And before you know, we're all going to be eating cat food. But the thing is, as you say, the longstanding rules of the game, without changing any of the rules, without rewriting the bailout book, the longstanding rules of the game are that everybody gets covered up to 250000 That's going to mean regular people. That's also going to mean small businesses. 
So they deployed everything they could to argue that this is going to be an absolute catastrophe. They scoured the internet looking for some mom in Ohio who had an Etsy site. And because what they're trying to squeeze out of this is they're trying to get a bailout for rich people. Mark Cuban had a bunch of money in this bank. He does not need a bailout. And for these Silicon Valley businesses out there. Now, the thing is, in a normal bank failure, banks fail all the time. They fail every week. The FDIC knows exactly how to handle this. And it's very simple. Everybody under 250 gets a check. Everybody over 250 gets a kind of coupon or a receipt. And then the FDIC is supposed to very quickly work out the bank, meaning carve it up and sell it off to other solvent banks, right? The bank doesn't vanish from the face of the earth. They just sell it on. And then all those rich people and all those businesses are going to, yes, they're going to take a haircut. They typically take about a 15 to 20% haircut, but you know they're not completely wiped out. And then the bank itself just gets sold on. It's reinserted back into the system hopefully with more prudent management. So those are the longstanding rules of the game. What they want to do here is they're talking about those human shields. They're talking about the mom on Etsy because they're trying to change the rules so that they will get a full bailout with no haircut for all those rich people. Right. And so that's the way it's looking. And as I say, a lot of people are saying, This is great because it satisfies everybody. It makes the depositors whole (laughs) and it doesn't, you know, all this, you know, we've heard this over and over. But let me read you, if I may, an excerpt from, as I mentioned, an article from National Review Online. I'm going to post it at tomwoods.com slash 2299. These are the relevant sections. SVB's, the Silicon Valley Bank, SVB's depositors are mainly the portfolio companies of VC firms, venture capital firms, meaning the main purpose of the bailout is to keep the VC firms whole. To understand why the argument for the government's bailout is dubious, one must first understand the bank's history. SVB was initially successful in collecting deposits from VC-backed businesses before later moving into growth-oriented services, including commercial banking, venture investing, wealth planning, and investment banking. It has played a role in starting and growing many successful companies, and for many years, it appeared to be a classic example of realizing the American dream through hard work and free markets. Yet, Somewhere along the way, and much to our detriment, SVB took its eyes off the basics, helping new, incredibly innovative firms to create massive value for shareholders, and instead started using its wealth and power to push a progressive political agenda through Environment, Social, and Governance, ESG, investing. And then going ahead, none of these ESG metrics indicated a looming, massive plummet in shareholder value. In other words, SVB chose to focus on ESG bean counting, rather than its core business of managing risk and returns in accordance with prudential banking practices. It is easy to argue for a government bailout when the depositors being bailed out are everyday Americans who happen to suffer the effects of some exogenous market-wide shock. It is much harder to make the same argument when the depositors in question are Silicon Valley elites who subscribe to the same faulty ESG philosophy. And then finally, Before the announcement that the government would bail out SVB, there had been a lot of public hand-wringing about losing 10 years' worth of innovation should the startups that stored their money at the bank be allowed to take a hit. Yet if a startup were worth investing in before losing its deposits, then that startup would still be worth investing in after losing them. The loss would have been a sunk cost, and VC firms would have taken the hit and rebuilt, investing in the most promising startups that emerged from SVB's wreckage. This would have been an especially appropriate outcome given that it was those same VC firms that forced their startups to concentrate deposits in a single, badly managed bank in the first place. Do you have any disagreement with that? (laughs) You know, this is always the game they play, right? Is the human shield. So they sketch this alternative reality where every company that loses more than 50 bucks is just going to be completely obliterated. The concepts behind them, civilization will grind to a halt. Always the same game. and. I quote your line all the time on the tissue fire, right? That zero interest rates sparks a tissue fire in the economy. It burns bright. It burns very, very short. That's precisely what happened here. It was easy money. They were losing billions of dollars out in Silicon Valley, but who cares? Money was free. And yes, you're going to have a comeuppance. And Silicon Valley Bank was downstream of that. Now, at this point, what they're trying to do is pretend that all of these zero interest rate tissue fire businesses were real deals, were advancing civilization to the next stage, when the fact of the matter is a lot of these guys should have never gotten money in the first place, 
at this point, if they're not a viable business, they should be liquidated. Good riddance. If they are a viable business, a 15 or 20 cent haircut is not going to do them in. I'm afraid, Peter, that you have done somebody a grave injustice by attributing to me the <laughs> tissue fire line. Oh, I've never no. heard that line before. Really? So, so yeah, so you're going to credit somebody about- else. It's the unknown soldier. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but I just saw a tweet of yours, and I'm going to also have your Twitter at TomWoods.com slash 2299 because people should follow you for sane commentary on all this. You were retweeting somebody who said that in a stress test in late 2022, SVB came out with flying colors because they never considered the scenario (laughs) in which interest rates rise. So it passes with flying colors, and you had some comment about Well, it seems to be the old story. There seems to be a pattern here of regulators being consistently outsmarted. And that really is one of the problems with trying to comment on these things, that you're dealing with commentators who have this mythology of the all-seeing regulator, and that no matter what the crisis is, there must have been either some repealed regulation that allowed it to happen, or somebody could have carefully crafted something that could have prevented this, that, or the other thing, or The regulators must have been mysteriously asleep at the wheel, but it's not mysterious because remember, the chief regulator of the financial system is the Federal Reserve. And in the years leading up to 2008, Ben Bernanke, who is the chief figure in the chief regulator of the banking system, said everything was fine. It's not like this is some mysterious thing we have to scratch our heads. Oh, I can't believe somehow the regulators did. The regulators tend to be the people who graduated number 278 in their class. Mm -hmm. You know, these are time-serving drones, but we attribute to them these magical powers and it makes it impossible to have a rational conversation because the myth of the all-seeing regulator means that they always have some fantasy scenario where everything could have turned out all right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's called the Nirvana fallacy, right? That is the entire essence of the left's argument for the government getting involved in the economy or in regulation is that somehow the government has this superhuman intelligence and benevolence, and we're just going to have God reach in and take care of this right here. And the thing is, there's this nice metaphor that they use in artificial intelligence, right? Where they say, well, what if AI gets real smart? And we say, well, you know, we'll just kind of keep it trapped. We'll just not plug it in. And the metaphor runs that, well, Imagine that hamsters are keeping you captive. All right, how long would it take you to outsmart them? Right, you would be free in an instant. So we can bring that over here where the hamsters that have held you hostage are the regulators. Wall Street can outpay them by tenfold. It out IQs them by 50. (laughs) If there's a regulator who knows what they're doing, then Wall Street will sit down and have dinner with them and talk about their bright future at, (laughs) X, Y, Z, not to name names. So they are captured. They are outsmarted, outwitted. They're government workers that are not particularly hardworking to begin with. The notion that they're going to control this stuff. So as soon as they put in some kind of prudential regulation, some kind of control or guardrail on the financial system, that is going to be outsmarted in hours to days. And at that point, we've got an economy where people are running around thinking that we've got a safety net. I don't know if you've seen, there's this video going around of this guy running across a bridge in China, and it's like a thousand foot fall. And the guy's just prancing along the bridge and he gets to the other side, doesn't fall through. He's got this safety harness on and it turns out the safety harness was not attached. That is our banking system. We think we have prudential guardrails. We got nothing because it was outsmarted as soon as the ink dried. This is the problem. If we were dealing with an industry other than banking, maybe the airlines or trucking, and you deregulate those, well, there could be no objection to that. It's obvious that just means that they're going to run more efficiently than if some government planner were telling them what to do and how many seats they could have and all this and that. But with banking, the problem is because the banking system we have is such a bizarro set of non-market arrangements with a Federal Reserve at the top, which is a creation of Congress, which is not a spontaneous creation of the market, which is given all these monopoly privileges. So now we have a cartel system. It has a monopoly over the money issuance. I mean, none of this is market driven at all. And so you could imagine a world in which regulation of this system is an attempt by people 
to take a weirdo system and somehow try to make it act the way a normal monetary system would act, where there would be some kind of risk-averse sentiment built into it, where there would be some protection for people, because it is a weirdo system. It's not a market system. So in other words, if you regulate it, it's not like you're taking some free market thing and you're unjustly regulating it. Mm -hmm. In this system, you don't even know. Maybe it should be regulated because it's not even a market system. But the thing is, when people complain that deregulation caused this, the thing is, nine times out of 10 or 99 times out of 100, they can't actually name me a regulation that would have fixed this or a repealed regulation that would have fixed this. It's, again, just some mythology about, well, there must have been some regulation that would have fixed it. So my point is, it's such a weird system that I can't even tell what the correct libertarian position is. Maybe it needs regulation. Maybe it doesn't. But the point is, when the pro-status quo people talk about deregulation, I look for what they're talking about, and I really don't see it. I don't see that any of the regulation that might have been repealed in the years leading up to 2008 had anything to do with 2008. And likewise, I don't think that there's anything that was taken away leading up to this that explains this or that would have prevented this. Right. I agree. What brought Silicon Valley Bank down was bringing down some other banks now, it looks like. Really, it's the original sin of fractional reserve banking. That's why the banks bought themselves a Federal Reserve. They are operating in a constant state of quasi-bankruptcy where they owe a bunch of money that's due immediately called demand deposits, and they don't have enough on hand. So therefore, they're sort of forced by survival to go and buy all of these privileges. It's extremely profitable for them. It creates enormous risks for us. The only way to get out of this, I think, is to render banking actually sound. That would mean separating demand deposits, checking, and time deposit savings, requiring full cash backing for demand deposits, which checking accounts are about 20% of the bank accounts in America. And then the rest of it would look like a CD and it would have normal time structure, just like any company. So like Ford Motor Company, for example, they've got many tens of billions, maybe hundreds of billions of dollars in bonds, but it's all got a due date. It's got structures. They owe 3 billion next week, 20 billion in a month, whatever. And so they plan out their cash flow. They don't need bailouts. They're not constantly in danger of, you know, Ford runs. They are a stable industry. And why is banking not like that? Because I think fundamentally of fractional reserve. Let me interrupt the conversation a bit with a political consideration rather than an economic one. Mike Cernovich has raised this issue and he says, now I'll grant you that, again, Silicon Valley Bank is not a bank that Joe Sixpack banks with. But the point is, it's not one of the major banks in America either. And so Mike is saying, What's happened before our eyes is that the Federal Reserve has, in effect, created a two-tier system where there is a handful of banks that are considered to be too big to fail. And whatever happens, they're going to be made whole. (laughs) But there's the other tier, which is the rest of us, that could potentially be allowed to fail. You don't know. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, but there's no guarantee that they won't be allowed to fail. And so what are people going to be likely to do as situations like this unfold They're going to be likely to take their money and just to be safe, put it in one of those gigantic institutions. Even if they had nothing to do with Silicon Valley Bank, they see the trouble that these institutions get in. They're not sure that they're going to be fully backstopped by the government and they just want to be safe. So they'll go to Citibank or whatever. And Cernovich says, now, forget the economics of it. From a political point of view, if you think being deplatformed is a problem now, Imagine if four institutions completely dominate or basically constitute the banking system in America, and you can't get banking services because you have the wrong opinions. Is that a danger? Absolutely. And, you know, you were alluding to that earlier with the ESG, right? We are an economy where the larger your business, the more you have to cater to regulators. You have to satisfy them. You have to lay awake at night wondering what will thrill them. Is it green stuff? Is it diversity stuff? The large businesses, as government gets bigger, those large businesses inevitably become almost a wing of government. And what we have now with this unstable banking system is exactly that. The major banks are getting massive inflows of deposits out of the regional banks. 
we've already lost about half of the banks in America, all small regional banks. We've already lost half of them in the past 20 years. That concentration is ongoing. Every time the system wobbles like this, you get another lurch towards concentration in those big banks. And if we look at how much they've catered, right, Wall Street has just absolutely floated the BLM movement, the diversity, the equity, all of these things. Why do they float them? If we look historically, most CEOs in America used to vote Republican overwhelmingly. Something like 80% historically voted for W. Bush or whomever it was. And that has shifted now, I think, to where we're almost in a totalitarian economy where if you are a large business, forget who you think should be president, forget what you think about the future of the republic, you've got to dance to the tune of the regulators or you're going to be out of business. This kind of concentration puts that on steroids. So he's making the argument that therefore we need to be prepared to bail out smaller regional banks or small local banks so that people will feel comfortable using them so that they won't all get swallowed up by the big ones. Yeah, for these small people, that's already the rules of the game at the moment. So for everybody under 250,000, they don't have any reason to flee. For the larger businesses, I think that is a risk, but really the solution there, we have to look to it longer term, which is we need to get the risk out of the system. So we need to ensure that all banks, large, small, are actually sound, right? So they have cash backing for their demand deposits. If we do that, then paradoxically, we level the playing field. We take away the risk advantage of the larger banks because what we have today is that we have one list of rules for the little guys, which at the moment, a bunch of them ran into trouble. Are they going to get fully covered? And then we have another list of rules for the big guys, which is that nobody even questions that. So we have this permanent sort of two-tier financial system where you've got the elite, where everything is covered, and then you've got the non-elite who have to negotiate it. And so what I you know, I think we should do from here is render the banking system sound so that you do not have that two-tier system. In a competitive sense, smaller banks tend to do a lot better than the big guys simply because they have community relations. So they know the people, they grew up with them. They may have generational relationships, family relationships with the borrowers. The borrowers are not going to stiff them because they live in the same community. So traditionally, the community banks, the smaller banks have had an advantage against the Wall Street banks. The Wall Street banks have been more for kind of the systemic rails. But I think because of this sort of putting balance on the table every time something goes wrong, that is exactly what's creating this two-tier system that has so far wiped out half of the banks. If it keeps going like this, it'll wipe out a lot more. Peter, do you know Caitlin Long? I do. She is fantastic. Okay. I ask because I'm sorry I don't know the details, and I really do want to get her on the show, but she's busy yes. till the end of the month. But my recollection is she had a hand in some kind of proposal for a very sound banking institution, Good. but yep. the regulators wouldn't approve it. And the presumption is that they wouldn't approve it because it would be so sound that it would suck the life out of all their crummy banks and they don't want that to happen. Bingo. Do you know anything about this? Yeah, that's exactly, that's the perfect description of it. And we saw that back in 2008 too, right? There were some banks that were sound, they didn't want to take the money and they were literally told, no, you must take the bailout money because otherwise you'll make everybody else look bad. Yeah, you'll stigmatize the other banks. We have to not stigmatize <laughs> anybody. So you all have to take it. Yeah. It's incredible. Like like the system forces you to be risky. and. Yeah, that's exactly what Caitlin Long did. She, so she wanted to open a bank out in Wyoming, and it was going to be a full reserve bank. So it was going to be completely sound. All of it was going to be back. She just got rejected. I think it was about seven weeks ago now. So it's incredible timing. So she got rejected really without explanation. I was talking to her while she was going through the process of it, and really no rationale. They just kind of didn't like it. So now here we are, what, six, seven weeks later, that all of these fractional reserve bankings are are falling. So she's really been vindicated. She's been a champion for full reserve banking for a long time. She's been very active and yeah, I definitely hope you can get her on the show. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm trying to remember. I can't remember if I have had her or if I've just talked to her a number of times just in person. I can't remember whether this is what happens when you reach a certain age. Was that a podcast episode or a dinner conversation? I can't even remember. But isn't that interesting that you would have a bank that gives people a choice for once, you can bank with an institution that isn't 
playing by the rules of this weirdo game. Right. And that is just not allowed. And so it can't be that there's too much risk involved. There is. That's precisely the value proposition of this bank. Like, is the minimization of risk. And then they refuse to do it. So but what do you say, though, to people who say, and surely you know this criticism, but if you do wall off demand deposits from savings or time deposits, let's say, mm-hmm. that you are artificially limiting the amount of investment capital available in the economy. I mean, if that money's just sitting there not doing anything, why shouldn't it get lent out to various projects? And why should only the time deposits be lent out? Right. So I think you know the answer to this, but you know, if we look empirically, about 80% of bank deposits are savings, in other words, longer term, and then about 20% are checking. So if we bring that over, then we would expect in full reserve that something like 20% would be in demand deposit accounts. Okay, They would have to keep the cash in the vault. The other 80% that might go into a CD, that is still going to be lent out. All right, so that's step one. You still got 80% of the money flowing. Step two is that even for that final 20% that's sitting there in cash, it's basically warehoused in the bank, it's absolutely there. Even for that final 20%, If that is sitting in the bank and it's out of the system and it's not in circulation, then that is effectively going to transfer its purchasing power to every other dollar in circulation. So think of it like if you took a bunch of money and you buried it in the ground and you didn't tell anybody where it was, it was out of circulation. It was in Albuquerque out in a bunch of drums in the desert. It's not circulating. That is equivalent to temporarily destroying the money. It's not part of the money supply functionally. And so effectively, even that final 20% where you've got those dollars sitting on ice in a bank vault, effectively, economically, they have been lent to every other dollar holder in the world at zero interest and zero cost. It's kind of charity. So the bottom line is that measuring by purchasing power, which is the only thing that matters here, measuring by purchasing power, 80% of the original dollars are still being lent out. The final 20% was effectively distributed to everybody else. Either way, all of the resources are in play. There are no factories. There are no workers. There's no land. There's no excavators that are idle because of this. All of the real resources are just like they always were. What do you recommend people read to try to get a handle on understanding money and banking? I always start with Rothbard, the case against the Fed. And what has government done to our money? Both are free at Mises, go in the order that you choose, but they're both super powerful. They're both pretty short, about 100 pages. I think Ron Paul's argument was largely based on case against the Fed. Super strong books. If you want to keep going down that rabbit hole, I would say read all of the classics by Rothbard. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. I put together a little ebook that I give away called Our Enemy, the Fed. And I was actually able to buy the domain OurEnemyTheFed.com. And when I buy these domains, it fills me with a warm, happy feeling inside that I own something like OurEnemyTheFed.com. So I got that out there. How do people follow you? Obviously, I'm going to, as I say, I'm going to put a link to your Twitter at TomWoods.com slash 2299. Anything else you want to say or link people to? Yeah, I'm on Twitter, Prof Stonge, P-R-O-F-S-T-O-N-G-E. I'm also active on Facebook. It's basically my name. And I'm putting videos up on YouTube. My wife is doing that. She is the tech person in the house. So that'll be up soon. Well, I said before we started recording that I've been watching a couple of your videos and the background of your <laughs> like home studio is so beautiful. It looks like a professional designer set it up. It is so beautiful. I'm envious of what you have there. And this was done in-house. So good for you. It's all my wife. She's the brains of the operation. Tremendous. Tremendous. Well, I appreciate your time today. I'm also going to link to that article that I was telling people about. So check out all this stuff at tomwoods.com slash 2299. I'll link to the books you mentioned as well. So there'll be a lot of great information for people on that page. Thanks so much, Peter. Awesome. Thank you for having me on, Tom. All right, folks, before we wrap up for today, a couple of things I want you to know. If you're interested in the kind of stuff we've been talking about today and you'd like a bit more background, I did mention Our Enemy, the Fed. So I wrote that. It doesn't cost you anything. Get that at OurEnemyTheFed.com. Also, my ebook, The Deregulation Boogeyman. You can get that at RegulationMyths.com. But there's a third thing I want to tell you about. 
And that is, I've got some listeners who have started, I guess they've been doing it for a little while, but it's still a fairly new podcast. And it is the Liberty Tree Podcast. You can find it at libertytreepodcast.org. Be careful, it's not .com, libertytreepodcast.org. And they describe themselves this way. They say, your hosts, Kelly and Matt, are both general contractors, fathers, and libertarians living and working deep behind the lines in Northern California. On the podcast, they bring a blue-collar aesthetic and common-sense sensibility to the current events of the day and seldom shy away from a good conspiracy theory. Sometimes the state of the clown world can be a bit overwhelming or even downright depressing. So these guys always try to keep things light, never take themselves too seriously. So come on in, crack a beer, and let Matt, Kelly, and maybe a guest tell you a story or two. So give them a shot. Why not, right? Why not? You may run out of Tom Wood Show episodes. You know, that's not impossible. So check out libertytreepodcast.org. And remember, you can get publicity like this if you're thinking of starting a website. I'll help you get a boost. I'll give you a boost with some publicity of my show. I'll give you membership in my private group where if you're having any problems or whatever, we all help each other out because you will have a problem from time to time. We'll help you out with your new site. It doesn't have to be a podcast, just a regular website you're starting. If you're thinking of starting a site or a blog, just get your hosting through my link. And as a result, you'll get a lot of nice goodies from me. Get all the details on how to do that at tomwoods.com slash publicity. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free. And we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.